Erica Anderson, Chief Revenue Officer at Notion. I'm so excited to be here. This is my first time at Slush and very excited to be here on the builder stage today to share my experiences building and scaling companies. Today, we're gonna to spend our time talking about how you build customer love. And I'm gonna share six lessons that I've learned throughout my career, which as you heard, included nearly 10 years at GitHub as CRO before I joined Notion. Now, before we hop in, I thought I would share a little bit about me. Like many of you, I consider myself a builder at heart. Building is what kept me at GitHub for nearly 10 years. Building is what drew me to Notion. And so why am I so drawn to it? Like many things, I like to go back to my early childhood in which I had so much fun and got so much energy from solving problems. My siblings and I considered ourselves mini inventors and we grew up in Kansas, so we had a lot of time on our hands. And so we liked to create inventions. My brother was the most creative inventor. He uh, did things like put toothpaste into gumballs so you didn't have to brush your teeth, which was pretty ingenious. My most labor-intensive invention was called the shoe twirl. I was inspired by this 80s movie. I don't know how many people have seen this. It was called Overboard. And there was a scene that had this rotating shoe closet that I just thought was so magical. Instead of dumping your shoes on the floor in the bottom of a closet, you could visualize these. And so at age 10, I actually made this prototype. I took a Lazy Susan, which is one of those plastic things that rotates in a cupboard, and I built this giant wood structure on top. It was about this high, and I made slots for all these shoes. Now, the invention had major, major design flaws, like you couldn't really fit the shoes. But I was so taken by the magic of being able to create that spin, to be able to solve this problem of like shoes in the bottom of your closet. And I caught the bug of being a builder, and I get so much energy and a rush from building things, including at companies. So now, by a show of hands, who's familiar with Notion? Oh, wow. OK, a good number. Uh, for those of you that are not, Notion provides a flexible workspace that helps connect your knowledge, your workflows, and your teams together. And one of the reasons why I joined Notion was to have the opportunity to get to scale a go-to-market motion for a very beloved product. And before joining, I spent a lot of time with the founders and leaders of Notion, and I was really drawn by the vision for Notion. And I was really reminded of the early days at GitHub, where there was a fantastic user community that was so passionate about the product, as well as this very opinionated product design. And this passionate user base and opinionated product design for Notion has turned into a lot of growth. Over the last four years, we've grown from 1 million users to this past quarter passing 100 million users. And it's not just that we have a great product, which we do. We have a great story that also supports it a story that's built around the challenges of collaboration and knowledge management, a story that centers around user problems, and a story that we've iterated on and grown with over time. So you may be thinking this all sounds great, but let's get to the part about how do we build customer love. So today we're gonna to talk about six lessons from throughout my career. Number one, Start with a problem, not a solution. Two, find a memorable way to talk about that problem. Three, empower your users to be co-creators. Four, listen, learn, iterate. Number five, love is built by strategic generosity. And six, scale without losing your soul. So let's get into it. Start with a problem, not a solution. Now, we know this is easier said than done. Solving problems is so rewarding. It's so gratifying. We do this every single day. We see problems. We come up with solutions. 
but it's also a very common mistake for early stage companies that you start with a solution in search of a problem. But to truly build a company and a product that customers love, you need to start with deeply understanding their problem. And as a founder, of course, you're pulled in so many different directions, but don't skip taking the time to continually talk to customers. It's important to true seek. We talk a lot about this at Notion, true seeking. What are the problem or problems that you're trying to solve? And you have to go direct to the source. And so for me, I regularly hear about problems for Notion that focus on things like collaboration, challenges with that, tool sprawl that's ever growing, how do you access company knowledge? And customers will readily share these problems, but importantly, it's how you probe and connect the dots from a systems perspective that gets you to what I call like the real problem. And a grounding perspective for this, for me, uh, is this quote here from Russell Eckhoff, who is a professor of organizational theory. And it says that you fail more often because you solve the wrong problem versus failing because you craft the wrong solution to the right problem. Really love this, so sit with that a second. And most of us are really, really good at kind of the first step and how do you find the real problem, and that's all about collecting information. And we've gotten really great at that. We've got so much information at our fingertips. But from there, it's really about the questions you're asking, like the five whys, or importantly, examining your assumptions that you're bringing to a problem. You can be skewing your perspective on what you're hearing. And problems often seem really obvious, and I always encourage people to keep breaking it down into smaller and smaller parts, because that is often where you truly find the real problem. And remember, every iconic company shared, started not with a brilliant solution, but usually with a deep, gnarly problem that needed solving. Now, I know most people are familiar with Airbnb's story, but they were designers struggling to pay rent in San Francisco. A design conference came to town. They noticed there were no hotels available. So they saw a problem. They bought the three air mattresses. They stood up the simple site that said air bed and breakfast. They offered attendees a place to crash, a homemade breakfast, $80 each. And there was the beginning of a very simple solution. And that seemingly very niche personal problem, as we all know, turned out to be a very untapped market opportunity, as Airbnb is now an 80 billion plus company. But why did it work, importantly? The founders personally hosted guests. They learned firsthand about trust and hospitality. They realized that this was not just about cheap lodging. It was about unique experiences. And by doing that, they also saw firsthand that there were two sides of that marketplace. There were the hosts that were looking to make extra cash. And then there were travelers that were looking for truly authentic experiences. And so the difference between a good product and a transformative one often lies in those early days of problem exploration. So ask yourself, are you solving what's obvious or are you digging deeper to understand what's truly essential? So that's how you start with a problem, not a solution. Which brings us to our second lesson find a memorable way to talk about your problem. So as we know, finding the core problem is only half the battle. Next, you have to make it truly impossible to ignore. And you do that by articulating the problem in a way that makes your customers feel deeply understood, in a way that makes them say, yes, you clearly feel my pain. And to make a problem memorable, you must transform a complex problem into a simple narrative, and there's a few ways that you can do that. First, you make the problem relatable, something that people identify with. 
Second, you need to make the solution crystal clear so people really understand how exactly are you going to fix it. And then, of course, you need to differentiate yourself. You have to show why you're uniquely positioned to solve the problem better than anybody else. And if you execute these three elements, relatability, clarity, differentiation, your solution won't just seem like another tool. It will feel like a revelation to customers. So think of Airbnb. They transformed strangers' homes into belonging anywhere. The revelation factor is crucial because here's an uncomfortable truth. Incremental improvements on the status quo do not generate customer love. No matter how polished it is, no matter how much better than alternatives. Customer love, the kind that builds a sustainable business, comes from that moment, that revelation, when users realize you're not just fixing a problem for them, you're transforming how they work, or how they live, or how they create. You're not just solving the surface problem that they came with, you're addressing that deeper system, systematic challenge that we talked about earlier. And you're communicating it in a way that makes them feel truly seen and understood. And one shortcut to revelation is the power of metaphor. Metaphor is a really magic device when you're bringing something new to the world. It connects new technology to familiar experiences. It helps you talk about a revelation or transformation in a very, very simple way. It focuses on how you solve the problem versus technical details. It creates a clear mental model for understanding the product. And best of all, as a founder, it can become your elevator pitch. So some famous tech startup metaphors here. Let's go back to Airbnb. In their first pitch deck, they famously positioned their service as eBay for space. And so again, they made that unfamiliar concept of staying in strangers' homes feel like finding a great deal in a unique space. Or Dropbox, the world's filing cabinet. That simplified cloud storage into something relatable, office furniture. And then Square, turn your phone into a credit card reader. That made people understand mobile payments related to a very trusted process that existed. And so at Notion, we use Legos to help explain our product and the problem it solves for our customers. That's because, like Legos, our core offering is a set of building blocks that you can package up in all different ways that you can dream of to create solutions. And building software is hard, collaboration is hard, creating, storing, sharing knowledge is hard, but we make the problem easy to understand and the solution creative and playful and delightful, just like the toy that many of us grew up playing with or still play with today. And this metaphor really works for Notion. And it tracks to this builder mentality that we have. And it identifies with words like creativity and play and making. So think about what metaphor works for you and your product. What words resonate with your customers? Now let's talk about Patagonia and Apple. You may look at these two brands and at first glance be, what do they really have in common here? One we know sells clothing, the other sells technology. Loads and loads of companies out there sell both of those things. But when you look at how they market themselves, they don't tell you to buy specifically the product to solve your problem. They're celebrating a mindset a mentality. So Patagonia, it's go, and we're in the business to save our home planet. They focus on the problem of preserving wild places, not clothing. Apple, as we all know, 
They speak to our identity as rebels and creatives, not phones and laptops. And what these two companies are really masters at are building emotional connections to their brand by identifying themselves with universal human problems and uniquely positioning themselves. And we hear that from our customers too all the time. That's why Notion is a powerful tool. Their favorite thing that we hear from users isn't often features, but rather it's a feeling, it's vibes. It changes the way that they work. So as a founder, the lesson here is never underestimate the power of emotion. And in some cases, like Notion, we use a mix of techniques. We use metaphors, we use emotion, we use design. So as founders, make sure you're paying attention to those details, the opportunities that you have for micro interactions that can make your problem relatable to customers. To make the problem even more memorable, you have opportunities in your user experience as people actually interact with your product. In this example here, we're pairing a customer testimonial about saving time and avoiding mistakes with a really friendly illustration that conveys how this will make you feel as a user. And as you build, here are some warning signs to look out for if your product is falling flat emotionally. So look out for declining engagement after there's kind of an initial honeymoon period or low emotional vocabulary and user feedback. And finally, purely functional user testimonials if they lack any sense that you're making their lives easier. And so these warning signs, they also all point to a single truth. You can't build enduring love in isolation, which brings us to our third lesson here. So while lessons one and two started on focusing on what's the problem and then making that problem memorable, lesson three is about empowering your users to co-create with you. So Notion has a rich community of co-creators. The product's flexibility has really sparked user innovation, which includes people creating their templates, sharing templates, selling templates on marketplaces, and a really active community of co-creators. People showcase their setups on TikTok, like you saw. They sell their templates on Etsy and Gumroad, and we have a Notion marketplace. And Notion, as I highlighted at the start, has some of the most passionate user communities around the world. This is a photo from a community meetup. This is our ambassador program in Japan. And this one is from Nigeria. And our ambassador program started as a grassroots effort. And it's an area over the years at Notion that we've fostered actively and invested in. And today, we have over 300 ambassadors across 69 countries around the globe. And these community-run groups reach 1.4 million users. And that word of mouth, that love for the product, is so much better than anything we could generate on our own. And in many ways, we talk a lot about this as a company. Notion is bigger than the company. It belongs to all the Notion creators who have made it their own. Your brand, it becomes so much more valuable, more lovable when people feel ownership of it. So the way we do this is by giving our community the tools to make their product their own. When users become those co-creators, they naturally become your strongest advocates. We've heard this time and time again from our community. They don't just use the product, they truly see themselves as helping us shape it. So they build templates, they share workflows, they teach others. And this creates a super powerful flywheel for us. There's more creators that generates more valuable tools that relates then to more engaged users. And then we get more creators. But here's the key. Building this co-creation 
it requires some things that make people uncomfortable. You have to ship early, MVPs, alphas, betas, and share that with those co-creators. They want to be there to help us and invest in it. They want to make it better. And the love for what you've built makes them even more invested to help you. Which brings us to our fourth lesson. Listen, learn, and iterate. As an early stage company, we all know this, pace is your greatest asset. So optimize for pace. I recently saw a video, I think it's been floating around the last couple of weeks. Uh, it was a video of Jensen from NVIDIA sharing why he does not wear a watch. And he said, it's because now is the most important time. And I really love that sentiment. I think that's incredibly focusing to work in the present. So that means listening, learning, iterating, shipping, listening, learning, shipping, iterating over and over and over again. And keeping your customers close as you do that. It's so important. And this is a lesson I learned early on at GitHub and continue to keep at my core today. Customer feedback is a gift. This is not a cliche. Customer feedback is a gift. It is a way that you build customer love, especially if you focus on the paper cuts that improve day-to-day -day life using your product. I continue to be amazed, both at GitHub and Notion, that often paper cuts garner the most emotional response, that customer love, than sometimes even our next major feature or, re or version. And there are a number of different ways you can create feedback loops. At Notion, you saw on the previous slide, we built a customer feedback catalog. And there's a number of ways to do that. But the most important thing is to make them easy, make them transparent, make them actionable. And ideally, if you can, this is really like the holy grail, make it a closed feedback loop back to the users. And it may feel like it's slowing you down to be super thoughtful on recording and cataloging, and that it takes away time from doing important things like building. But the opposite really is true. It really is. You're going to speed up your progress. And what we're talking about today, you're going to increase your customer love. And for me personally, I mix the calls and the customer feedback I get. I like to talk to economic buyers. I like to talk to decision makers. I talk to pure end users of our product because they all have different perspectives that can really round out what you decide you need to understand, what do you need to prioritize next to take you to that next level. So if you listen, learn, and iterate in the right way, your feedback loops will follow some of these principles, ideally all, but some is good. You will treat early adopters as partners. You will acknowledge every piece of feedback. You'll be transparent, you'll show progress, and you'll credit ideas generously. At GitHub and Notion, founders, leaders, product managers often end up responding to feedback directly on X or Twitter, whether it's product requests or support issues. And this is such a powerful signal on how you take customer feedback. And I've seen firsthand what happens when you have that product dialogue and the relationships that we form with users by showing that commitment to that type of interaction. And what we've learned from all of these interactions, from late night Twitter responses to surprise feature launches based upon user feedback, is that generosity isn't just a nice to have, it's a strategic imperative. And this brings us to our final lesson about the economics of giving. Love is built by strategic generosity. Strategic generosity can help you win hearts and minds, and there are a number of different ways you can do this, but let me share what worked at GitHub and Notion. We made a deliberate choice to invest in startups, students, educators, and offering Notion for free wasn't just altruistic, it was strategic. And by being strategically generous with these groups who really appreciate and need those free tools, we create future champions. 
And because students love the product, we've seen, the, seen them become ambassadors. We've seen them go on and bring Notion to the companies where they start their careers. And it allowed us to capture a key demographic early and benefit from their advocacy over time. So always make sure you're seeding the future. Being generous when you can, especially with younger users, will grow with the product and they will bring it with them as they transition. And if it's done right, it really can be a growth strategy for your company. But here's where people get nervous. They worry that being generous means you're sacrificing growth. But in reality, what I've seen is it's truly quite the opposite. You can combine a community-led approach with other growth strategies. At Notion, we've layered on sales-led growth. And it works because the customer love that you built through community creates momentum. Your sales team doesn't just sell features. They're able to sell proven impact. You're able to point to passionate users and thriving communities who don't want to work in any other tools. And the product starts to help sell itself because these users are advocates. So our final most important lesson, I know I said final before, but it's how to scale this love without losing what made people fall in love in the first place. So we call that, how do you scale without losing your soul? So building, being a builder is hard, right? It's not for everybody. And we know there's a scale paradox that many startups face as they grow. The early magic comes from those close customer relationships, from taking the time to truly understand problems, from forming those emotional connections we talked about. But we know as growth pressures mount, there's a need to look for more growth, you prioritize speed above other things, you chase metrics over meaning, and to, you end up forgetting what made people fall in love in the first place. And here's the truth. There's a world of endless options out there and it keeps growing, and your soul is your competitive advantage. Users can be fickle, if you disappoint them, they can leave. But if you maintain what makes you special, they will usually stay loyal. So your soul is your competitive advantage. And remember that. And there's a few ways to make sure you continue to cultivate that. All leads back to customers. At Notion, our founders spend a lot of time with customers, students, the community. And at every company gathering, our founder and CEO, Ivan, always brings us back to our core values of creativity and building useful, beautiful tools. We live and breathe very specific company values. And the soul of Notion is really existential. And we don't want to lose sight of it, because that can be your downfall. And to keep that customer love intact, you have to always return to those core values, make them operational. So what does that mean? Embed those values in everything you do, how you hire, how you look at performance how you measure things. Customer love, not just growth. At Notion, we actually have a survey. We call it the Love Survey, L-U-V. It stands for how much people love, use, and value your product. We run it every year. We take those learnings. We bring it back and how we build the product, how we talk about the product. All right, so let's do a quick recap of what we learned. The journey from problem to passionate community isn't linear. It's a continuous cycle. You gotta be building, evolving, listening, stay true to your core. And remember, start with the right problem. Make it memorable, impossible to ignore. Empower your community as co-creators. Move with purpose in the now, listening, learning, iterating. Be strategically generous. And as you scale, protect what makes you special. Because in the end, sustainable growth is about getting better at serving the people that believed in you at the start and who you've acquired along the way. And that's how you build not just a product, but a generational company that lasts. So thank you for being here. If you have any questions at all, you can find me at erica at makenotion.com and happy building. Thank you so much.